Hello? Yes, good evening. Hello, I think we can uh, begin. Time is eight Israel time. Um, okay, so welcome to our participants who are joining us from around the world. My name is Mara, and on the behalf of my colleagues at the Hebrew University's Division for Advancement and External Relations, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar. We are honored to have Eric Bernheim here today, who will introduce Professor Shai Shalev Schwartz. Eric is one of the Hebrew University's closest friends from Geneva in Switzerland, a senior partner emeritus of McKinsey and Company, and the vice chairman of the Asura Health Insurance Group. Eric is a member of the Board of Governors of the Hebrew University and president of his Swiss Friends Association. Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mara. Dear all, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar, focusing on what is next, what is ahead of us after these first lockdowns in most countries. We will learn about the reasons why we should collectively and probably individually focus on the vulnerables. It's an even greater pleasure for me to introduce Professor Shai Shalev Schwartz. He received his PhD from Hebrew University back in 2007 and was a research assistant professor at the Toyota Technological Institute in Chicago until June 2009. Shai is now a professor at Hebrew University's Russian and Selim Benin School of Computer Science and Engineering. But he also is the CTO, Chief Technological Officer of Mobileye, one of the most successful Israeli company acquired by Intel in 2017. Shai is a prominent figure in autonomous driving technology, and he also significantly contributed to advancing research on machine learning, online production, and practical algorithm. Shai, you have written more than 100 research papers and published excellent books on machine learning and I think you published the, the first one in quite early times, so congratulations also for that. We continue to make sure there will be no more casualties from car accidents in the future, but more specifically and short term, we look for, forward to a very captivating presentation and discussion. So to take an old term, old times terminology or pre-COVID terminology, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Um, let me share the slide. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk about a, a work uh, I've done together with uh, Professor Amnon Shashua, um, the CEO of Mobileye and also a professor at the Hebrew University. Uh, it all originated from, uh, from uh, the Prime Minister of Israel that approached Amnon and uh, asked for some advice on <clears throat> what, is, what should be the strategy of Israel to uh, tackle and manage the COVID-19 crisis. Um, so uh, we started to, uh, to look into it and what I will try to share with you is some of the ideas and uh, our recommendation and um, uh, feel free to stop me. There are parts which are a bit technical, but <clears throat> but you can stop me at any time and uh, and I can uh, explain. So, in order to consider a crisis management or a policy for crisis management, we first need to to define the objective. Uh, what are the considerations in order to assess a policy? So, bas the basic questions that people are focused on is how many people will die from COVID-19, but in fact, you want to ask how many people will die from any reason relatively to the annual average. Because if you uh, propose some policy which uh, significantly enlarge, say, the number of people that uh, are going to die from heart attacks, uh, currently nobody counted as a uh, as a result of uh, COVID-19, but this is clearly wrong. Uh, if your policy causes people to die from other reasons, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's still bad, right? So 
the, the, third, um, <laughs> the third consideration is uh, will the healthcare system collapse? Um, then we need to, uh, to ask how many people will be severely ill. Is the policy practical in terms of available resources? For how long will the policy be sustainable? And what is the economical and social price of the chosen policy? So we need to tackle all of these. I will not uh, consider all of these in this talk, but a good policy should, uh, should at least uh, say something about all of these issues. What are the policies that, uh, that countries around the world adopted? Um, so basic policies are to do nothing, uh, to uh, propose some social distancing, uh, maybe mandatory and maybe just uh, recommend uh, the population uh, to have some levels of uh, social distancing. There is precision uh, quarantine, meaning uh, you want to uh, track all the people that, uh, that got the virus as good as you can, maybe by technological uh, contact tracing, uh, or uh, just by epidemiological uh, uh, um, investigations for every infected uh, person. And uh, of course, you can also have a full lockdown. And many countries the, around the world started with one policy, switched to another, switched to another, uh, which is not bad at all, but it was not always for the right reasons. Um, what we propose is a risk-based resource allocation approach. And I will elaborate on this proposal. But before that, you may ask why computer scientists advice about, uh, about the coronavirus. Uh, I'm not a, a, doc a medical doctor and I'm not an epidemiologist, uh, but I think that uh, some of the tools that we are using uh, as computer scientists are very relevant for, uh, for this type of problems. And I will discuss some of the computational tools for analyzing a policy. Okay. Um, so so uh, the outline is giving you three very, very basic tools for analyzing the policy. And then I will describe our approach. So um, there's three tools that I'm going to talk about are first the law of total probability and the definition of conditional probability. It's very basic uh, tools in uh, probability and statistics but yet uh, these are powerful tools. Then I will mention briefly concentration bounds. Again, I will not go into the mathematical details, just give you the, um, the essence of uh, what are concentration bounds and why they are useful. And finally, uh, more relevant specifically to, uh, uh, to uh, spread of diseases, uh, I will explain uh, compartmental models and in particular one model which is called SEIR, and this is a very popular model uh, for analyzing uh, epidemics or pandemics uh, such as COVID-19. Okay, so the law of total probability and conditional probability. Um, the, the nice thing about these two laws uh, or definitions is that you can write them in one line, each one of them. Uh, so the first one, if you have two events A and B, then the probability that A will happen equals to the probability that both A and B will happen, plus the probability that A will happen and B will not happen. And this makes a lot of sense, right? Um, then conditional probability is uh, defined by the probability that both A and B will happen equals to the probability that B will happen and times the probability that A will happen given that B happened. So let's uh, see some example. We want to estimate the prevalence of corona. Um, so define A to be the event that someone has died from corona. What is the probability that someone is, has died from corona is a probability of A. B will be the, effect, the event that someone has been infected by corona. And Estimating the prevalence of corona means we need to estimate the probability of the event B, 
the probability that some random person from the population has been infected by corona. Now, by using the two laws, the two basic laws, and the fact that one can't die from corona without being infect infected, you can write the probability of A equals to the probability of B times the probability of A given B. Why this is good? So if we have a population of uh, size M, we can conclude that the probability of A, which is a, the probability to die from corona, it is roughly the number of corona death divided by the, the size of the population. And from the equality, we can write it as probability of B, which is what we want to find times the probability of A given B. Now the probability of A given B, we can, we can uh, estimate it. This is a, what is the probability to die given that you have been infected by corona. You can estimate it by data from all around the world. Um, so, so if we know this number, we can monitor the probability of B, which is a prevalence of corona, by monitoring the probability of A. This is just counting the number of corona death and uh, dividing by the known quantity probability of A given B. And this is very important because how, how can you monitor the dynamic of, a, of the pandemic? In order to monitor the dynamic of the pandemic, you want to monitor the prevalence of the disease. But it's very tricky how to, uh, to know how many people are infected in corona. Many of them will not even come to, to be tested uh, because they are asymptomatic, because maybe they are sick, but they are young and uh, it's, a mild, uh, it, it's a mild disease for them and, uh, and they will not, you will not know. So it's very hard to monitor the prevalence of corona di directly. But using this um, equality, you can monitor the prevalence by monitor other quantities, for example, the number of deaths, or you can uh, monitor it by the number of uh, ICU beds that are being used at any moment. So this is a very uh, important uh, tool in order to, uh, to track the dynamic of the pandemic. Okay, the second uh, tool um, is concentration bounds. What is concentration bounds? So suppose that you flip a coin n times and it falls k times on its head. What can we say about the probability that the coin will fall on its head? So the, the, real, the real answer is that it can be any number between zero and one, but some of these numbers are very unlikely. So the, the common wisdom is that you want to estimate the probability of head by k over n. But this is just an estimate. What you can say about the confidence interval. So concentra concentration bounds, they have a form of giving you the probability of head, bounding it both from below and from above by some formulas. These are um, designated here by the functions g and f. Uh, and these formulas can, can give you confidence interval on what is the real value of the probability of head. So again, it's a very common uh, tool in uh, statistic, statistics and machine learning. It is very useful for making claims about, uh, about uh, the disease. Okay, uh, the last computational uh, tool is compartmental epidemiological models. And the one I will describe is called SEIR. The basic idea of uh, this model is to divide the population by and large into compartments. We don't care about the details. We only care about what compartment one person belongs to and what is the size or the relative sizes of the different compartments. So in the SEIR model, we have S for susceptible persons. These are people that did not get the disease yet. E for exposed persons, people that has been exposed but are still not ill. I for infected persons, people that has been infected and now can infect others. And R for recovered persons. These are persons that may be either recovered or dead or still be sick, but are, now long, are no longer infectious uh, for others. And then over time, you want to monitor uh, the number of people in every compartment each day. 
And then you can des describe the dynamics of uh, these changes by different equations. Um, so if we plot these, this, these compartments in a percentage out of the population, we, so we see uh, curves. These are the known curves of, uh, of the pandemic. What we see is that at the beginning, the susceptible is almost 100% of the population. And uh, the number of uh, exposed, infected, and recovered is very, very small, almost 0%. Now, as the pandemic starts, the number of infected and, and exposed is increasing, okay? The number of susceptible is decreasing, and the number of recovered is increasing. Then we have the peak of the pandemic. And then what happens is that many of the people now become either immune or dead, but are no longer in the equation of susceptible. And therefore the pandemic goes down and, uh, and, and the number of infected persons goes back to zero. So the rate uh, of this curve is very important. Um, so what you see here is two uh, curves, two such uh, curves, one for basic reproduction number of three and one for basic reproduction number of 1.5. This number, what it means, it means how many, uh, how many people an infected person will expose in total if he will just meet person from the susceptible compartment. Um, so if this number is large, then uh, we have a, a sharp curve. And if the number is small, we have a more flat curve. And all the talk about flattening the curve, this is basically what it means. Now, why do we want the curve to be flat? For two reasons. First, the peak of the curve, when it is flat, the peak of the curve is much lower. And the peak of the curve is correlative to the load on the health system. This means how many people will be sick simultaneously. If the peak of the curve is, hot, is, is large, lar like here, like on the left-hand side, then at the peak of the pandemic, you will have 10% of the population uh, sick at the same time. And then the health system might collapse. On the other hand, if the curve is more flat, then at the peak of the curve, you don't have that many number of persons sick, and then the health system uh, will, uh, will not collapse. The second reason to flat the curve is that the peak comes later, so you have more time to prepare for it. And the overall number of people that got the disease is lower. So in the, in, when the basic reproduction number is three, almost 95% of the, of the population will eventually get the virus. While if the basic reproduction number is 1.5, then only 60% will get the, the virus eventually. And it will also take much more time to reach the saturation. And maybe in that time, we will find a cure or a vaccine. So now you see the, uh, the basic reproduction number that I mentioned before, uh, before and uh, two graphs. One shows the percent of infected at peak, which is correlated to whether the health system uh, will collapse or not. And the other, uh, the other one shows uh, the number of recovered persons uh, at uh, the end of the pandemic. So as I mentioned before, as the basic reproduction number increases, both the percentage of infected at peak and the total number of recovered persons um, increases over time. Okay, so these were three computational tools for analyzing a policy. Now, uh, what is our approach? The, the motivation to, other, to our approach is that in fact, it seems like we have two different diseases. One disease is mild. It is mild for one group of the population. And 
For, for another group of the population, uh, the disease is ferocious and actually uh, very dangerous. Um, uh, so we, we did this analysis and, uh, and uh, saw that uh, while the case mortality rate, the probability to die from corona around the world is around uh, a half percent, which is a lot, uh, from Israeli data, we observed two distinct population. One which we call it high-risk population, which is uh, people above uh, 65 or with certain comorbidities. For this po population, the mortality rate is around 2%. While for all the rest of the population, the low risk population, the mortality rate is around 0.02%, which is actually better than the common flu, much better than the common flu. So the mortality rate is between 100 to 200 times larger in the high risk group relatively to the low risk group. From this, the conclusion should be obvious. We need to protect the vulnerable, the people from the high risk population, because saving, uh, if you have a resource and you want to invest it in the high risk population, then, um, then you uh, decrease the overall number of deaths by a factor of 100 or 200. Because, because of the difference in mortality rates. So uh, based on this simple observation, uh, what we propose is uh, three levels of social distancing. The first one is a very mild social distancing among, among the low risk group. Um, so um, um, the idea is that by doing this, you both prevent economic collapse and also you don't rely on uh, scarce resources. You rely on abundant resources like wash your hands, okay? It's not expensive to wash your hands. Um, or maybe uh, wear, wear a mask and uh, don't have a, a too large crowd and, and things like that. Uh, so this is the first uh, level of social distancing then you need a reasonable but stricter social distancing among the high-risk group. But the most important thing is to have a very strict social distancing between the high and low-risk groups. You don't want a leakage from the low-risk groups, uh, for, from the low-risk uh, group to the high-risk group. Um, how can you achieve this very strict social distancing? Simply, we need to invest uh, all the resources in protecting the vulnerable. For example, protecting nursing homes. So if we have a uh, corona tests, uh, we don't have enough corona tests to monitor the entire population all the time. It's better to use a corona test uh, in nursing homes because there the risk is very high. Or you can issue a special ID to high risk members that will entitle them to special considerations in public places. Like, for example, uh, someone from the high-risk group wants to go to the supermarket, then he will not need to stay in line. Okay? He will get priority and uh, someone will uh, spray, uh, spray uh, uh, the area where he needs to put his groceries and, um, and uh, uh, people will let him uh, do his shopping and uh, go back home. Uh, likewise, people from the high-risk group would be entitled to work from home or receive a paid leave of absence from the state. Uh, and it's very important to constantly monitor the leakage from the low-risk group to the high-risk group and to adapt the social distancing accordingly. Um, so this is basically our proposal. Um, and uh, in order to assess its quality, uh, we adopted, uh, we, we adjusted the SEIR model to an SEIR model with two populations. So instead of four comp compartments for susceptible, exposed, infected, and recovered, we now have eight compartments for both the low risk and high risk. And instead of one basic reproduction number, we will have four. And uh, this basic reproduction number will determine uh, what is the 
uh, infection within the low risk community, within the high risk community, and between the, the, the communities and the populations. And basically you want that between the population, the reproduction number will be very small, while uh, inside the low risk of population, it can be uh, higher and uh, it can be something that, that is achievable by mild social distancing. Um, so these are the equations, it's uh, differential equations. And, um, and we analyzed the, the equation and then we wanted to estimate the probability of, uh, of, severe and, uh, of being severely ill and death for the two populations. Uh, so we, again, we took uh, from Israeli hospitals uh, data and we found out that out of uh, 247 deaths, when we did this research, only one from the lowest, uh, only one was from the lowest group. And by applying concentration bounds that, that I mentioned before, uh, we find an interval of the factor of death rate between the low and high risk population. So the basic uh, idea is these two graphs. On the left hand side, you see the number of infected people over time. And you see that the blue curve is for the low risk population and it is much, much higher than the curve for the high risk population. So these are the number of infected. The right curve is the number of severely ill people from each population. And here you see almost the same. And the reason it's almost the same, even though the number of infected in the high risk group is much smaller, it is because the probability to be severely ill in the high risk group versus the low risk group is very, very different. Uh, so this is how we balanced the overall curve. And then you can make sure that uh, the health system will not collapse. You can also make sure that not many people will uh, die from both populations. Um, so uh, just to uh, conclude, um, what, what we needed to do is to handle uncertainties. And the type of thinking uh, that we adapted uh, has uh, two reasoning. And actually these two reasoning uh, comes from uh, our work on, uh, on uh, autonomous driving. Uh, so if you think about a self-driving car, uh, you see that you need to handle a lot of uncertainties when making decisions. For example, when you uh, drive in a, an urban uh, street, Maybe there is a little kid that might run behind an occluded uh, car. Or when you approach uh, an intersection, what will other road users will do? Maybe they violate a red light, maybe not. Uh, if you come to a roundabout or to an unprotected turn, there are many uncertainties. And, uh, you, and, and the type of thinking that we have is that you need to be careful but you shouldn't be paranoid. So you want a worst case uh, type of thinking, but you also need some reasonable assumptions. So the same thing in uh, handling uh, the virus here. You want to be paranoid and, and you, uh, you want to be uh, cautious and you want uh, to be careful that the health system will not collapse and you want to be careful uh, that uh, you are not overestimating or underestimating the risk. Uh, on the other hand, you must make some reasonable assumptions. For example, one of these assumptions is that uh, for the coronavirus, someone that has been infected will not get infected again. Uh, the CDC issued a, a warning. We don't have a scientific evidence that this is the case. But if this is not the case, then hope for a vaccine uh, is in vain. Um, and based on all the knowledge on other members of the coronavirus family, uh, it's a very reasonable assumption to think that if you have been infected, then you won't be infected again, at least for most of the population. Um, so you want to make these assumptions. On the other hand, you want to be careful about all the numbers that you estimate. The second thing that um, uh, for handling uncertainties that we took from um, autonomous cars is that you don't want to make a decision and then stick to it no matter what. 
you need to be agile. You need to constantly replan your actions, reevaluate your model, your model. If you have new evidence, don't stick to the to the old uh, assumptions, but recalculate and think again uh, what uh, what can happen. And very importantly, you wanted the delay between when the word has been changed and when you know that it has been changed would be as small as possible. Um, so it's very important to uh, to uh, to to build the right tools in order to monitor correctly. Uh, the pandemic. Um, what is the role of uh, mathematics and theory in all of that? Uh, I like to uh, uh, to mention two uh, quotes that I, that I really like. Uh, one of them is a, a rephrase of uh, Kurt Lewin uh, a quote uh, by Vladimir Vapnik uh, that nothing is more practical than a good theory. Um, so I, I really believe that uh, writing the right abstractions and the right models is very, very practical. On the other hand, you should not believe that uh, my models and other models are correct. They are most certainly wrong. Uh, all of them are wrong, in fact, but some of them are useful. So we need to be modest and we need to know that when we model something in the nature, uh, our models are not going to be right but it's enough that they will be useful, that they will give us the right tools on how to handle uh, reality. Um, so uh, to summarize, um, our approach is to focus on the vulnerable and uh, by uh, taking the more scarce resources for protecting the high-risk group, um, scarce resources like corona tests, hotel rooms for isolation or pay of leave. Uh, it is better to use them on the high-risk group because protecting one person from the high-risk group will give the same statistical effect as protecting 100 persons from the low-risk group. Uh, for Israel data, where analysis predicts that the health system will not collapse. Uh, of course, the, um, when dealing with uh, pandemics, there will be deaths and every death is a, tra is a tragedy. Um, but our analysis shows that the number of deaths uh, will be even smaller than alternative uh, uh, policies because if you put all the resources or most of the scarce resources on the high risk group, then uh, you are using uh, your resources in a better way. Um, I will stop here and uh, if there are questions, I would be happy to answer. Thank you very much uh, for your interesting lecture. So, uh, as you said, we can open our question and answer um, time and uh, um, Anybody is welcome to ask their question by raising the digital hand or by writing in the question and answer box. Okay, we have um, Mary Simu. I allowed you to talk, you can speak. Mary, you should unmute your microphone. Oh, okay. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation, uh, Professor Shows. So uh, when it comes to the compartmental epidemiological uh, model, you're looking at the susceptible, the exposed, the infected, and the recovered. And then um, it's like we are only focusing on the high risk and the low risk. Can is it not giving in room for the, you know, the in between? Because if, like, you to draw a line, like the high and the low, they're not about the middle population. Where do they fall? Um, so I, I, I didn't hear the maybe the three last uh, words, but uh, did you ask about the line between the high risk group and the low risk group? 
Yes, yeah, so the, if we were to categorize the population into the high risk and the low risk, definitely there's the in-between population, if we can talk about the middle kind of a risk. Is your model taking care of that? So you can, you can uh, adapt the model and make it more and more complicated um, to have a continuum between the low and high risk groups rather than a sharp uh, distinction between the, the low risk and high risk groups. In fact, uh, uh, the proposal is, not, is also uh, uh, can be adapted to a continuum because instead of talking about three levels of uh, social distancing, you can, you can say that you should apply social distancing based on your risks. So if you are at a higher risk, then you need more social distancing. And if you are uh, at a lower risk, you need less social distancing. And instead of saying just here are two levels, you can say it's a continuum. But when you talk about public policy, then it's very important to, uh, to give simple instructions. Simple instructions are clear and can be fulfilled. Complicated instructions are maybe better, but in practice, they will not be, um, they will not be fulfilled. So, uh, so the, the, the idea is to, uh, and, and what we did is that we showed that the, the model is actually, um, is actually uh, uh, robust, uh, to uh, have some robustness to uh, leakage. Uh, what is important is to monitor all the time. So if you monitor all the time, you can see if the line is not sharp enough, then you can have uh, stricter rules for protecting the vulnerable. And if the situation is okay, then, then the rules can be milder. It's very important to monitor it all the time. Okay, thank okay. you very much. I, I see some um, some uh, questions in the chat. Should I refer to it? Yes, I think that few people are asking the same question is about the Israel government. If the Israel government implemented every, uh, any of your uh, solutions, and if yes, what happened? Um, the same question is going around. So um, I can say that our proposal was uh, to the letter adopted by the Israeli government, uh, but some aspects of it uh, that have, has definitely been adopted. For example, um, uh, the focus on, on the nursing homes uh, is a direct uh, result of, uh, of our model, and we discussed a lot uh, with decision makers that uh, it's much more important to use the corona tests and uh, in the past, there were scarce uh, in masks and in other protect, protective gear uh, for, uh, for personnel. Um, we, we advise that it's most important to uh, use uh, these uh, scarce resources for the nursing homes. What I think will happen is that uh, if there will be a second wave, we don't know if there will be, but if there will be a second wave, uh, the tool of uh, full quarantine that was adopted by the Israeli government, I think it will be very hard uh, to apply it again. And uh, the prime minister and, uh, and the government uh, understand that uh, if there will be a second wave, uh, then they need to adopt something more similar to our proposals. And in, in this regard, there was uh, an um, instruction from the prime minister to, uh, uh, to the relevant committees uh, to build a plan for the second wave based on our proposal. Uh, I, you, as, as you probably guess, um, uh, there, there is also a lot of politics around all, all of these decisions. Um, so I can't guarantee that uh, if there will be a second wave, there will, be not, there will not be panic and, uh, and uh, more uh, draconic uh, unnecessary in my opinion, uh, tools. Nobody can uh, know the dynamics of the, of, uh, the politics, but at least uh, there, is, there, is a, uh, there is a listening from decision makers uh, and uh, appreciation to, uh, to this proposal. 
Um, now Thank I you. see. Uh, uh, question uh, from Julian. Uh, sorry, we have a question from Julian Dave in the um, question and answer box. And he's saying a total separation between the two population is impossible. Are you considering a coupling variable between both populations? What should be the guess value if yes? Yes, so the answer is yes. Uh, we are considering a coupling uh, variable. This is a, uh, we modeled uh, instead of a single uh, basic reproduction number, uh, we had four uh, and the four are between the low risk group to itself, between the high risk group to itself and from the low to high and high to low risk groups. Um, the, the guess value that, uh, that we used depend on some demographic uh, data that we got from, uh, uh, from the Central uh, Statistics uh, uh, Institute of Israel. Um, so uh, the, the number that we, uh, that we used is that every infected person in the low risk group uh, on average will infect 50, uh, sorry, the, the other way around. Every 50 infected uh, persons from the low risk group will infect one from the high risk group. There is some robustness to this number and it can be higher or lower, uh, but this is a basic uh, recommendation. And we think that this is achievable because many of, uh, of the people from the high risk group are either uh, older people that either live alone uh, or with a spouse uh, from the same high risk group or with uh, one member not from the high risk group, but then uh, they are living with, they, they are meeting a rather few people from the low risk group. Um, so if there will be another wave, of, of course now people are meeting their children and uh, th then uh, their children and grandchildren and uh, are being less careful because now there are not uh, really uh, many sick people in Israel. But if there will be a, a second wave and we will see again a large number of, uh, uh, of positive cases, then as we saw before, uh, the people from the high risk group will be more careful and uh, it's reasonable to assume that uh, most of them will protect, will be protected. Um, now I see another question from uh, Suzanne. Um, was this model, was this the model that was done to the Israeli government or, so, so I already referred to this question. If there are more yes, questions. We have, we have another question from Alan Pollard, we, which uh, partially you already answered, I think. Um, often high risk and low risk people live in the same household. Doesn't this make it difficult to keep the two groups separate and how much does this undermine the model? Um, so yes, this is, this is a, the biggest difficulty if the model indeed. Uh, um, and uh, the the way uh, the way to deal with it. So first, we while there are some people that are living uh, with a member from the low risk group in the same household, uh, we we did uh, perform a demographic uh, analysis, as I mentioned before, and uh, the numbers are not that bad. And then uh, when uh, when this happened, then there are several possibilities. One possibility is that the member of the household, which is also from the low risk group, will behave as if he is from the high risk group. Um, another option is that uh, the government will, uh, uh, will provide, uh, at least in some cases, also uh, hotels and, uh, and places. Um, and, but, but even uh, another example, so, uh, the evidence is that uh, if people are being careful, and usually uh, uh, older people can be careful, um, then uh, then you can protect yourself in even in the same household. So suppose that uh, uh, say a 70 years uh, old uh, is living with uh, with uh, her uh, grandchild of 20 years old. Uh, she can be careful. Uh, if, if they are both careful and understand the risk, 
then they can be protected. It's not like, it's not airborne, the virus. It's, uh, you need uh, uh, to sneeze on someone or, or uh, to touch. So just washing hands and, uh, and uh, having uh, separate uh, rooms, uh, the evidence showed that uh, it can be enough if being uh, performed properly. Thank you. So let's see if in the chat we have one more question. Um, I think we have answered all of them. So maybe we can wait a few seconds to see if someone else would like to ask another question. So David Stambler is asking, what is next in your research in this area? Um, so uh, it's, it was like, um, um, I, I don't think I will uh, continue uh, researching uh, in this area. It's, it's not my main research area. Uh, it was like a, a reserve military service for the uh, per the request of uh, the Prime Minister office. Um, um, my, my research is focused on another thing that I believe will, uh, in the long run, save uh, many, many more lives. And this is uh, my work on uh, self-driving cars. We are progressing uh, very nicely. And um, we hope that uh, the the thousands of people that are dying each year from car accidents will be something that in five to 10 years, people will look back and will uh, say how people lived like that. It doesn't make sense. Uh, hopefully the future will be bright. So thank you a lot. Uh, thank you for your very, very interesting and important presentation. Um, thank you to all of you that uh, listened at the presentation and connected with us. Um, hope to see you. We have uh, more webinars uh, next week. And uh, thank you, Professor Schwartz. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.